welcome to movie review number 15 about the 1996 science fiction alien invasion movie Independence Day. I really like this movie. It's awesome and stupid in about a hundred different ways. First, when it came out, it was a blockbuster. Independence Day was the highest grossing movie of 1996, beating out all of the other summer movies that were playing at the time. Second, it was credited as being a reawakening of science fiction. When the Star Wars movies came out in the late 70s and early 80s, it caused a huge storm of excitement and interest in science fiction. But this waned over the 80s and early 90s. And when Independence Day came out in 1996, it revived this interest in aliens and science fiction in popular culture, and was followed by a wave of new science fiction movies. Will Smith is one of the lead actors in Independence Day, and immediately after he was done working on the movie, he started work on Men in Black, which was another sci-fi movie that earned even higher praise and acclaim. Third, Independence Day didn't just revive the sci-fi genre, it was the birth of large-scale disaster movies, which is a subgenre that would include future releases like Signs, The Core, Arrival, Sunshine, and others. This loose subgenre runs the gamut, including movies that are an erudite exploration of human psychology to movies whose nonsensical ham-fisted plots are just an excuse to film explosions for an hour and a half. While the quality may vary, they're pretty reliably entertaining. Alright, so I'm going to stop listing the cool stuff about the movie, and get into the movie itself. So the movie begins with a colossal alien mothership coming near the Earth. It deploys dozens of disc-shaped craft, each of them huge in its own right, some 15 miles wide, and they all come and enter Earth's atmosphere to settle over major population centers. These scenes are really cool, because the ships are first portrayed as flaming wreaths of boiling gas arcing across the sky. This is not just a cool visual, it's a scientifically plausible visual. Such a huge object sweeping into our atmosphere would create condensation and clouds around it, which would be heated by the friction. As the ship descends, these clouds would roil and streak along it appearing as they did in the film. <laughs> now, I don't mean to focus on clouds, but I did think that this was a really cool touch. So, as the ships are spreading out over the Earth, a scientist named David Levinson, played by Jeff Goldblum, decodes an alien communication signal and concludes that it's an attack countdown. He tries to warn the president, played by Bill Pullman, of the alien attack, and they try to evacuate the cities, but it's too late. The alien ships open up their belly-facing weapon platform and fire huge beams of energy down into the Earth, creating a cascading wall of fire that sweeps outward and incinerates everything and everyone in a radius around the impact point. These scenes are intense, but the special effects have not aged well. The quality is on par, if not a little worse, than the original special effects of the first Star Wars movie, which was released almost two decades earlier. Now, there isn't really any mention of the technical details of alien propulsion. The movie doesn't really discuss how they traveled between the stars, or how they power their massive 15-mile-wide saucer ships, or how they can fly such huge ships in an atmosphere, deep inside Earth's gravity well. On a technical level, the movie doesn't really explain anything. All of the typical staples of space-faring science fiction are glossed over. But I guess this isn't that big of a deal, as the movie takes place entirely on and around Earth, and the details of alien space propulsion are not really relevant to the plot. Besides, leaving this stuff unexplained only adds to the mystery and the eerie alienness of the antagonists. So at this point in the movie, the nations of Earth rise up to attack the alien disc craft. They release swarms of alien fighter ships, and there's an all-out dogfight involving a huge number of warplanes. The humans get wiped out, 
because the alien ships have force fields. Again, there's no technical description of how this technology might work. All we know is that it's invulnerable to hardware, like missiles and bullets, and it has to be disabled with software. The character played by Will Smith is a fighter pilot named Stephen Hiller, and he survives the attack and tries to escape into the Grand Canyon to shake off his alien pursuers. Eventually, Hiller ejects from his plane in a deception maneuver, which causes the alien to crash. After parachuting down, Hiller hits the ground really hard, like blow out your knees and shatter your ankles hard but 30 seconds later, he's up and hopping towards the alien ship. He gets up to it, and the door opens, and the alien pilot jumps out at him with tentacles wiggling around, and it's making a horrible screeching noise, but he fearlessly punches it in the neck and knocks it out. Then he drops a couple one-liners that are just goofy. After hitting the alien, he's like, Welcome to Earth! And then he lights a cigar and says, Now that's what I call a close encounter. I know they're trying to appeal to a wide audience, you know, including like families and children and stuff, and maybe the Welcome to Earth line was pretty well delivered, but overall, this is not how I would expect the encounter to happen. When the alien jumps out at him, he reactively hits it, and that's understandable, I suppose, but he wasn't nearly freaked out enough. This is some insanely creepy alien entity, with literal masses of tentacles, and a slimy coating of who knows what kind of poisonous, psychoactive, or caustic chemical covering its body. The implications of seeing this alien immediately before you are massive. It means aliens are real. It means they have an advanced civilization that's way beyond humanity. It means they're here on Earth. And it means they want to exterminate your species. This is the context of the encounter. It's terrifying. It's a nightmare of Lovecraftian proportions, and yet our spunky pilot protagonist throws a few punches, belts out some one-liners, has a laugh and smokes a cigar like it's no big deal. It is a big deal! And in real life, that pilot would be shitting his pants and screaming with his head in his hands because the future for him and his family and the human species is grim. All right, so Hiller loads the alien into his parachute and drags him through the desert, where he conveniently meets up with a fleet of refugees in motorhomes. They're also quite conveniently close to Area 51, and they drive right up to a conveniently conspicuous entrance point with a guarded gatepost. They show the alien to the guard, who conveniently lets them in with no further registration or verification or anything at all, including the entire fleet of random refugees. All of this convenience really pushes the plot along nicely, but it stretches credulity. I mean, that security guard was a pushover, and he would be court-martialed for letting in all of those civilians to this highly restricted area. Also conveniently for Hiller, the president had just recently come to Area 51 and was told that aliens crashed at Roswell and a faction of the government had been doing research on it in secret for decades. Conveniently for the president, who was there at just the right time, Hiller arrived bringing his live alien, which they hand over to the scientists. The lead scientist is named Dr. Brackish Okun, played by Brent Spiner. I love Brent Spiner and I really liked his role as Data in Star Trek The Next Generation, but in this movie, his character gets wasted pretty fast. During the initial research, the scientists try to open up the, quote, biomechanical suit, unquote, that the aliens wear. This biomechanical suit is a really cool concept, and I think Independence Day actually did it in a really extreme alien way. So, like, in that movie District 9, there's that big exosuit that's mostly mechanical, but has some elements of biological integration. This biomechanical suit in Independence Day is mostly biological. It's like a larger, stronger body that's been grown around the alien's actual body. It's like a crazy advanced spacesuit technology that protects the smaller, softer, less physically imposing alien entity encased within it. So they cut open this biomechanical suit, and the alien inside wakes up. 
It attacks them and kills all of the scientists. Dr. Brackish Okun, who names their kid Brackish? He's a person, not coastal swamp water, but whatever. So Dr. Okun is attacked by the alien too, and with a tentacle, it lifts him up by his neck. The tentacle manipulates his throat to make him speak, so that the alien could communicate with the president, who was watching all of this go down from behind an observation window. The alien says there can be no peace between them, and the humans kill the alien. During this encounter, it psychically communicated to the president, and he saw its plans. These aliens, he says, are like locusts. They move from planet to planet, eradicating the native species and taking all of the natural resources for themselves. They're exterminators, basically. Now, this is scary and all, but it turns the aliens into stupid one-dimensional bad guys with a very unnuanced and incurious civilization. We're expected to believe that this super-advanced alien species puts itself in danger to take resources from inhabited worlds, when all of the resources it could need, from minerals to gases to water, it can all be found at no risk on asteroids or uninhabited planets. The only thing that's unique to Earth is its biology, but the aliens seem uncaring and indiscriminate, choosing to vaporize everything so they can, I don't know, mine for metals that they could find in asteroids? You might notice that there's a lot of plot holes in this movie. It's fun, and it's awesome in a cheesy, macho, kick-ass kind of way, but as far as an actual story goes, it's pretty bad. So, after seeing that the aliens are totally unreasonable douchebags, the president orders a nuclear strike. But because of the alien shields, it's ineffective. The next day, Jeff Goldblum's character writes a computer virus that can disable the alien shields. Now, you might be wondering, how did he figure out the alien code so fast? How did he write a virus for their computer systems so fast? How did he translate the alien signal into binary? Do the aliens use binary? How is 1997 Apple technology able to take down the shield network of a super-advanced alien mothership and war fleet? What's going on here? The answer is, don't think about it. The movie doesn't explain it, so just chill out, bro, and go along with it. That seems to be the general theme of the movie here. So anyways, they infiltrate the mothership. They use the virus to disable the shields. They shoot some missiles, and then they escape before blowing the whole thing up. With the alien shields deactivated, the humans launch the counterattack and begin taking down the alien craft. It's weird how, without their shields, the alien attack ships are kind of crappy, and they can be taken out with FA-18s. It's weird because our warplanes today could smoke the FA-18 in no time. But these super-advanced alien ships are just terrible. They have a super low rate of fire, they seem to be pretty slow, their sensors appear to suck, and they just they have a terrible accuracy. They can't do anything. Without their shields, without being invulnerable, they're just pieces of crap. It's so one-sided that the humans run out of missiles because the aliens are so easy to destroy. This actually leads one character to engage in a pretty heroic act of self-sacrifice that ultimately ends up saving the human species. He's got a pretty badass one-liner while he does it, but I don't want to spoil everything, so go watch it for yourself. One of the rather unappealing aspects of the film was its blatant product placement and its heavy nationalistic themes. Jeff Goldblum's character uses a Coke can during a lesson about the Alien Shield technology, and he uses an Apple product too, which was shown in an unprecedented advertising campaign. Perhaps the most grossly obvious product placement was when Stephen Hiller's dog brings one of his shoes onto the bed. This is the scene that introduces the character, and it's played by the famous actor, and the first thing that he says is something about his shoes. And on screen, you see his dog go through this heavily trained performance routine to bring him a Reebok shoe, with the logo prominently displayed. It's so obvious and in your face that it's gross, 
and the fact that it accelerated this trend of product placement in movies makes it even grosser. Now, product placement is one thing. It's one pretty gross thing. But the overt nationalism is a whole nother beast, and the entire movie reeks of it. From the president's speech, to all the fancy American military hardware being shown off, to the Americans spearheading humanity's resistance, to the freaking title of the movie, it's all incredibly nationalistic. Independence Day is a goofy thriller that I don't think takes itself too seriously. Maybe it did, but looking at it now, it just seems silly. It has its flaws, but overall, it's a solidly fun movie. I'm going to give it a 2 out of 10 for the plot, because, let's be honest, it's pretty thin and illogical, and a lot of stuff doesn't make sense, or it seems poorly thought out, or it's rushed. It's almost like the director had this mental image of the White House being blown up by the aliens, and the entire movie was built around that. As for its depiction of biology, I gotta give the movie a 3 out of 10. There weren't any huge glaring problems, but just a lot of little nitpicks. Hiller's girlfriend would have roasted alive in the service corridor she hid in to escape the wall of fire. After an ejection and a hard landing, Hiller probably wouldn't have been able to hop around like he did afterward. He probably would have fractured some bones. The alien in the laboratory at Area 51 was grabbing Dr. Okun's throat to make him speak, but it wasn't pushing his diaphragm, which is what actually allows the doctor to breathe in and out and make audible words in the first place. There was just a lot of that, a lot of holes like this, and I found it distracting. As for the aliens themselves, they were super cool in concept, especially their unique permutation of the stereotypical gray alien and their badass biomechanical armor suits. But the aliens seemed to be both smart and stupid. They can make giant spaceships, and they can travel between the stars, but they're cruel and indifferent and incurious, and they seem to choose inefficient, violent, and risky ways to gather their resources, when it's totally unnecessary and needlessly destructive. Independence Day is a fun Hollywood filler movie. It's full of explosions, snappy one-liners, and creepy alien antagonists. But it suffers from a weak plot, flimsy patriotism, and technical details that don't hold up to scrutiny. Go see it if you want some simple, casual entertainment, but don't expect a mind-twister like Arrival, or the emotional complexity of District 9. Independence Day is just not that kind of alien movie.